Thank you very much, and a very good afternoon to you. Despite the rain, you're soldiering on. Uh, as I came on site only this morning, uh, but I believe the weather was great yesterday, so I think I missed a treat. Um, but as I came on site this morning, I thought there'll be nobody there, surely. Um, but here you all are, and on the wider side, proving me well and truly wrong. Um, so, as is the traditional greeting of Muslims, and I, you know, I will uh, give you the same respect, if not more, than I would. Uh, well, actually, that sounds a little bit dodgy. Uh, than I would, uh, than I would any other crowd. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Greetings of peace and blessings upon you. Um, it's great to be here. It's my first green belt, so um, be gentle. Oh, wow. <laughs> Thank you very much. As I stand here, I feel like um, I feel like the spokesman or the spokesperson even for God, and it's kind of an odd feeling because I've sort of thought a lot about five things about Allah and women, and uh, thought, well, actually, what is it that God would want me to say? And I think that's a, a red herring to begin with because we offer our insights through our own limited understanding of, of who or what God is, and we do that through our own, our own specific lens. So I'm going to share with you um, a few things that, that I feel uh, are important about Allah and, and women. Now, there's no better place to start than from the Qur'an itself, because Muslims believe that the Qur'an is a revealed word of God. So it's only fair that I start with God's words. Um, when Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was asked about God, the answer came directly from God in the Quran. God said, He is God the One, God the Eternal. He begot no, no one, nor was He begotten. No one is comparable to Him. And so it immediately sets out this, this, uh, this powerful God that essentially created all that is and resides above it, within it, as part of it. But it he cannot be replicated. There is nothing like him. I say him. We'll, we'll deal with that one a little bit later. So notice when I read out this verse uh, from the Holy Scripture of Islam, as I said, the Quran, I am using the word God. I've immediately stopped using the word Allah. Because when we speak about Allah, we are speaking about God himself or herself. Um, the Quran was revealed in Arabic. So many of the terms that we hear about in Islam actually are Arabic. So people may speak a very different language to Arabic, English, uh, French, German, Spanish, Punjabi, Gujarati. But when it comes to Islamic concepts, they revert to Arabic. Uh, so words like Quran, Islam, uh, Sharia, as we just heard, uh, and many others like Quran and Hadith are Arabic words. And there's no, I guess the, the, what I'm trying to say is that, they, that Allah is not the God for Muslims. Allah is just the God. And I guess there's no better way of explaining that than when looking at our brothers and sisters, our Christian brothers and sisters, in places like Syria or Lebanon. Uh, when they pray, when they worship, when they talk to God, they talk to Allah, right? Because their first language is Arabic. And if you actually look at the Arabic translation of the Bible, you will see where we see God in English, you will see the word Allah in, in, in the Arabic Bible. And so, I guess when you or I talk to God, we talk to Allah, we're talking to one and the same thing. Our journeys, our paths ultimately lead to God. In fact, language can be a really powerful thing. Um, it can be powerful enough to bring us together and to separate us or tear us asunder. And the language that... I use or we use to draw closer to our creator can be any which we choose. Our multilingual God understands any language, any emotion, any feeling, any thought that we might have, regardless of who we are, where we're from, uh, or whatever we choose to call ourselves. And I came across the words of Rumi. I don't read Rumi very often. I should, I should read him much more. Uh, but for those of you who are unfamiliar with Rumi, he was a 13th century Sufi poet. He's known popularly as a poet, uh, as, a poet uh, as a philosopher, but also he was a jurist and a theologian. And those two things don't seem to quite go together. You know, one's very scientific and the other is very arty and creative, but he wrote um, many a wonderful poem. One of the ones that I wanted to share with you is, I searched for God among the Christians and on the cross, and therein I found him not. I went into the ancient temples of idolatry, 
No trace of him was there. I entered the mountain cave of Hera and then went as far as Kandahar, but God I found not. With set purpose, I fared to the, mount, the summit of Mount Caucasus and found there only Anka's habitation. Then I directed my search to the Kaaba, the result of old and young. God was not there even. Turning to philosophy, I inquired about him from Ibn Sina, but found him not within his range. I fared then to the scene of the Prophet's experience of a great divine manif- manifestation, only a two-bow length distance from him. But God was not there, even in that exalted court. Finally, I looked into my own heart, and there I saw him. He was nowhere else. So that's really struck me, that we come, at, we come to God from all sorts of different positions. Islam, Judaism, Christianity are just three examples. Um, but actually, are we talking to one and the same being? Now, one of the things I wanted to share you about is, the, is I find that God gives great hugs. In all honesty, for most of my formative, formative years, I had actually no idea that I'd want to get close to God one day. Um, in fact, if I'm honest, I didn't quite like the God that I understood to be God at that time. The God that was always angry, a bit miserable, and uh, just waiting to meet us so we could be punished for all the wrongdoings that we'd committed in our life. And as a child, that didn't quite ring true for me. It didn't work. It didn't connect. I mean, my friends would get told off in school or in, uh, well, in, in mosque, especially in the after school clubs, that if they were eating sweets in class, that God would be very angry. And goodness knows what that could lead to. So it was a real revelation as I grew older that I found, as we've heard previously, a just but loving God. A God that loved me, but also all of those around me, who, who, particularly those who believed in him, that they could feel that love was immensely um, empowering. So it was quite overwhelming. And this relationship um, continued over, over a number of years as I learned, as I studied, as I engaged, as I talked to him. And I found that that was the key, even though it's hard to do sometimes, right? But just by talking to him, I found that that, that sense of love increasing. Um, now, we all know our shortcomings, and you know, I guess God knows ours better than we know our own. Um, but God says to me in the Quran that he's closer to me than my jugular vein. Now, that's really close, right? Very, very close. Um, and it took me a while to understand that. What does he mean when he says, why, why jugular vein? Why not anything else? Why not I'm right by your side? But in addition to all the other places that he describes himself to be, he describes himself to be closer to me than my jugular vein. And this makes me feel comforted and strong. It gives me a real sense of strength, especially... I guess when we're living in a world and, and, and more and more of us are living on our own, I guess in, in the sort of, when you're even surrounded by hundreds and hundreds of people, sometimes it can feel like a very lonely place. And so this gave me a lot of, um, a lot of support. What an incredible thing to know that God gets me. He understands me, not just as a believer, not just as somebody who worships him, not just as somebody who, who I guess, takes steps to understand him, but also as a woman, and I know that can sound a little bit odd, it can sound a little bit strange, but it's really, really important, I think, um, for, for me, but for others also, to understand that God reaches out to me just as he does to men, just as he does to anybody else, and that for me to understand him and for me to have a close relationship with him doesn't have to be through, I guess, the translation of a text that's done by a man or has to come through um, a man it can actually be just me and him directly. And I, you know, when I discovered that, that was a really, really powerful feeling. And I've tried to hold on to that um, ever since. And so when I say that God gives great hugs, he really does. Because in, you know, whether it's in, in a gathering like this and I'm sat in a corner in, the, in, a, in one of these marquees, or whether it's in a, public, in a private place, I'm just closing my eyes and thinking about who he is and the fact that I'm not having a great time of it right now and just feeling the need for a hug and reaching out to him, I feel that strong sense of a powerful hug, a hug like, a hug like no other. Um, now, there's, there are lots and lots of things that I wanted to, to say to you today about 
God's feminine traits and how I believe that God is a feminist, even though it's probably one of the best kept secrets. But if God believes in equality, he believes in justice, he believes in all things to be fair and equal amongst men and women, then God is a feminist. Now, God describes himself in Islam through many, many different mediums, uh, in different ways. But one of the things that he does is he gives us 99 names to describe, for us to understand him. So names like um, the compassionate, the merciful. Uh, we heard before about justice and love, so God as, as the most just. The fashioner, uh, the creator of the matter and the creator of the soul. The forgiver. All of these names he's given us so that we can help, we can understand him better. And although many Muslims will have their favorites, mine are two for today. The first is the most merciful. And the second is the most gentle or the kindest. And these in Arabic are Rahim and Latif. Now, I told you we were good at using the Arabic language when, whenever we were talking about Islamic content, concepts, but when I understand the English, it really helps me to gain a sense of closeness to God as the most merciful, as the most gentle. Now, there are many of these names that people would argue in the Arabic language come from a masculine root or a feminine root. Now, without going into the linguistics and knowing that my time is up, um, Rahim and Latif are feminine, as are many, many, many other, other names that he has prescribed, um, that he has used to describe himself. And I find that really quite endearing. Why would he choose masculine and feminine names to describe himself? Is it because he wanted women and men to be able to connect with him? Is it because he is trying to tell us that he is neither male nor female, and he understands both women and men in a way that we can't even begin to fathom because of the limitations of our mind. And so it really struck me that when we have both the masculine and the feminine names, that we really need to try and work on using the feminine and stressing the feminine a little bit more in order that we create a sense of balance, that we don't see God as male, as inherently in our language, especially in the English language, we tend to see it, say he or him, so we, that we start to understand him as neither a he Perhaps neither even a she, but as, as a being and as our creator. So, um, essentially, language, hugs, the ability to feel close, his feminine traits and his love are all the things that I discovered about Allah, about God on this wonderful journey called life. Thank you very much.